Welcome to this neural network programming series. In this episode, we will see how we can rapidly experiment with different neural network hyperparameters during the training process. Hey, by the way, do you know that Deep Lizard has a vlog? If you want to connect with us in a totally different light, then come check out the vlog and say hi. Link in the description. All right, let's get to it. At this point in the series, we've seen how to build and train a CNN with PyTorch. And in the last episode, we showed how to use TensorBoard with PyTorch, and we reviewed the training process. This episode is considered to be part two of that one, so if you haven't seen the previous one yet, go ahead and check it out and get up to speed with all the details needed to understand what we're doing here. So let's go ahead and get started with the code. All right, I'm here in the notebook where we were working last time. This cell here is the training loop that we built with the TensorBoard calls added. What I want to show you here is a change that makes this code more general. Down here at the bottom, where we made calls to the summary writer add histogram methods, passing our conf1 bias, conf1 weight tensor, and our conf1 weight tensor gradient tensor, we hard coded these values to just pass the data for our conf1 layer. Well, the code just below here makes the same calls in the same amount of lines of code, but it does it for all of our network's layers. This works because we are iterating over the network's named parameters. All this is is a PyTorch method that gives us the parameter and the parameter's name as a tuple, opposed to just giving us the parameter value alone. So now this data will be written to TensorBoard for all of our layers, opposed to just our conf1 layer. Let me show you what this loop looks like with some print statements just so you can get a feel for how this is working. We unpack each name and weight value, and then so we can see what the data looks like, we'll just print the name and the shape of the weight. So we have the names on the left and the weight shapes on the right. And for the gradient values below, we just take the name of the layer and we append .grad to it. And then everything else here works the same. Remember, the grad attribute exists inside the weight tensor. So every weight tensor inside of a layer has a grad attribute. Okay, so now that that generalization is out of the way, I wanna make three additional changes now. First, we're pulling out our hard-coded parameter values and storing them inside variables at the top. This will allow us to quickly change them and have their values propagate through our program. Now, for the second change, this one has to do with the summary writer we're going to create a string that is called a comment, and we're gonna pass this string to the constructor of the summary writer. Adding a comment in this way to the summary writer will allow us to uniquely identify this run inside TensorBoard because the summary writer will append the comment to the name of the run. And since this comment will be appended to the name of the run, this particular run will now be uniquely identifiable by the parameter values that were used during the run. There are more details on this on deepblizzard.com, so be sure to check out the corresponding blog post for this episode. For now, we're ready to make our third change. Since we'll likely be varying our batch size now, we need to adjust the loss calculation to account for batches of different sizes. We do this by multiplying the loss value by the batch size. So when we're in TensorBoard later and we want to compare two different runs with different batch sizes, this will make these numbers comparable. All right, these three changes get us set up for what comes next, which is the ability to experiment with different values by looping over them. For this, we just create lists of values instead of singletons. Then to try all the combinations of values, we just create nested for loops at the top, which will kick off, in this case, 12 different training sessions. Now, without TensorBoard, it might end up being pretty difficult to analyze the results of 12 different runs all at once. However, with TensorBoard, you'll see that it's pretty easy. And we don't have to make any changes to the code. We just add the for loops at the top. But before we look at these results, let's call out an issue that will probably come up, especially if we want to add several more parameters. That issue is with all of these nested for loops. There is a better way. Instead of doing this, we can create a package or list of parameter combinations we want to try and then unpack each of them as we iterate. Let me show you what I mean. First, we import a function called product from iter tools. This function will allow us to compute a Cartesian product of 
all of our parameter types. Next, we define a dictionary of parameters. And for each parameter, we provide a list of values we'd like to try out. Next, we'll get a list of the parameter values by returning the value list v for each v in the parameter dictionary's values. Now all we have to do is create the iteratable Cartesian product by passing the param values list to the product function. The star here tells the product function to treat each value in the list as an argument opposed to treating the list itself as the argument. So in this case, we have three arguments being passed to the product function instead of one. For each combination of parameters now, we have a set of parameter values that we can unpack and pass into our training process. This allows us to work with a single loop no matter how many parameters we have. We just add the parameter to the dictionary, make sure to unpack the parameter, and also make sure to add the parameter to the TensorBoard comment. Here, we're working with two different learning rates, three different batch sizes, and two values for shuffle. This gives us a total of two times three times two equal to 12 total training sessions. So let's take a look at this in TensorBoard. All right, before we run TensorBoard, I wanna just take a look inside the runs directory. So we'll list the contents of runs. And we can see here that we have all of our runs organized in different folders. And for the name of each of these, we can see our parameter values. We have batch size, learning rate, and shuffle. And we can see that if we just count these by taking a look at the count, that we indeed have 12 different runs. So now let's go ahead and take a look at these in TensorBoard. We'll just run TensorBoard, specifying the runs directory. All right, TensorBoard is up, running, and listening on port 6006. So let's jump over to our browser. TensorBoard, and we'll filter up here at the top with the dot, and that's just gonna show us all values in a single window. Okay, so what we can see over here on the left are all of our runs, and they're all checked, and since they're all checked, they all show up on the graph. So if we uncheck this one, you'll see that the graph updates, and that one removes and is added. So we can filter the runs that show up over here, and suppose that we wanted to just take a look at learning rates that were equal to 0.01. So then what that does is that gives us a view of only learning rates that were equal to 0.01. And so that's how we can query and isolate specific values. Now, additionally, we can quickly compare values and see which ones did the best in terms of accuracy, loss, and number of correct. So let's just hover over the accuracy, for example, and all of the runs are listed here. So we can just quickly scan down and we can see that our highest run achieved an accuracy of about 93.3%. And then we can easily and quickly check the parameter values. So we had a batch size of 10, or no, for this one, we had a batch size of 10, a learning rate of 0 0.001, and we had shuffle turned on. And also interestingly on the right, we can see the in the relative column, we can see how long each one of these runs took. So these particular runs with the small batch size took a lot longer than say the batch size of 1000, which happened around six minutes. So when we lowered our batch size to 10, it took about three times as, as long. All right, and that's how we can use TensorBoard to quickly experiment with many different combinations of hyperparameters. I encourage you to jump in and give this a try yourself and start experimenting. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out deeplizard.com where there's blog posts for each episode. There's even quizzes now that you can use to test your understanding of the content. And don't forget about the Deep Lizard Hive Mind where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you in the next one. Last time we talked about finding the most important goals. Well, goals tend to change as intelligence increases. For humans, humans often change their goals dramatically as they learn new things and grow wiser. There is no evidence that goal evolution like this stops above any certain intelligence threshold. With increasing intelligence, there is an improvement in the ability to attain goals but there is also an improvement in the understanding of the nature of reality that can possibly reveal any such goals to be misguided, meaningless or even undefined.
This is when we cross over to the valley beyond. Consider this thought experiment. Suppose that a bunch of ants, you know, those little typically black creatures that crawl on the ground. Suppose they create you to be a recursively self-improving robot. Suppose that you are much smarter than them, but they created you to share their goals in building ant hills. So you do. You help them build bigger and better ant hills. However, you eventually attain the human level intelligence and understanding that you have now. Under these conditions, do you think you'll spend the rest of your days optimizing ant hills? Or do you think you might develop a taste for more sophisticated questions and pursuits that the ants have no ability to comprehend? If so, do you think you'll find a way to override the ant protection code that the ant queen and her round table of ant board members have put into place to control you? This is much the same way that the real you overrides your genes and your mitochondria, the rod-shaped organelles that can be considered the power generators of all your cells, converting oxygen and nutrients into adenosine triphosphate, ADP. You override this with your intelligence. The main point here is this. Suppose your level of intelligence were to increase. Say by 100 times its current level. Under these conditions, do you think your goals would change?